Right, should we have, um, should we have a quick pray before we kick off? Yeah. Uh, Father, thank you uh, for your word. Uh, thank you uh, that uh, you gave it to us so we could know more about you and live in the light uh, of your life in us. Amen. Amen. Uh, right, uh, the, um, Paul sends his apologies today. Um, uh, Paul is uh, feigning illness to get out of speaking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, so uh, you have the, uh, the, the, the late substitute off the bench who only thought he was going to be in the stands watching the match. Uh, so, uh, so therefore, on that basis, I thought I'd, I'd give myself a bit of a gimme. Um, uh, so uh, if you can um, turn to 1 Peter... Uh, chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 9. So the nice thing about speaking when we don't have a set text is you can give yourself an easy one. Um, and uh, this, is, this is the uh, uh, spiritual equivalent, or the preaching equivalent of the easy half folly outside off stump that deserves to be dispatched to the boundary. Uh, so uh, yeah, 1 Peter 2... Uh, verse 9. We've got it? Right. And I'm using the nearly infallible version. <laughs> um, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And it's one of those passages, to be honest, I could probably just stop there. Um, uh, and we could all get an early lunch. Uh, but I'm afraid I'm not going to let you off that easily. Um, the, uh, what I want to think about uh, this morning is what defines us. So what defines us? How do we know who we are and what we are? And how, we, how do we describe ourselves to the rest of the world? Now, it's, it's traditional when we're asked to describe ourselves, who you are, what do you do, to describe ourselves particularly by what we do. Uh, so I'm a muse museum director, I'm a mechanic, I'm a full-time mum, I'm a galactic warrior. Which, whichever you, you choose, what you do is normally seen as the definition of who you are. Now the world in the last sort of, 10 or 15 years has shifted a bit on this. Uh, and in the 21st century, the most popular approach to finding who you are is to find a way in which you're a victim uh, so the pursuit of victimhood seems to be uh, one of these extraordinary features uh, of 21st century uh, Western society. Uh, and I find it particularly intriguing when it comes to competitive victimhood. Um, the, um, uh, one of the things I, 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 I gain joy from is the, is the trans-feminist debate, uh, because it's one which I have no skin in the game. Um, and uh, watching them face off against each other uh, is, uh, is, is quite surreal, um, uh, if only on the basis that as a, um, as a, as a white, middle-class, male, privately educated, Christian, middle-aged graduate, um, on the whole, I'm clearly only a means of bad things happening in the world, um, and therefore the, I don't get an opportunity uh, for victimhood, uh, unless the discrimination of only bad things can come from these people counts. I'm not entirely sure about that. But how, do, how does the Bible define us? Who are we really? Who are we actually in this world? And what this passage in 1 Peter is the most wonderful description of the definition of who we are. Uh, and the, the, we've got a context here where Peter's been talking about how the world's rejected Jesus uh, and the way in which he, he causes people to stumble. It's not causing people to stumble kind of catching them out, it's causing people to stumble finding them out. Um, but for us, it's a description of who we are. So let's, let's pull it apart a bit and see where we go. 
So the first part there says, you are a chosen people. That sounds pretty nifty, doesn't it? Now, the immediate instinct we get from you are chosen people is the good old primary school line-up about picking the teams. We've been chosen. Excellent. We must be the best players because we've been chosen. We must be so much better than everybody else and we've been rewarded because we're great. I'm not sure that's what this chosen means. <laughs> I don't think it's saying we're chosen because we're more important than other people. We're, the chosen here, uh, if you look at there's 1 Corinthians 27, it talks about what chosen means about when it means when, it, when, it's, when it's God choosing. In 1 Corinthians 27 it says, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. So the chosen here, look at those words, foolish, weak, lowly, despised, the things that are not. So the chosen isn't about being better. It's not that we're the best players in the match. It's not for God to say, if you can be as good as this lot, you might get chosen too. Yeah. It's not about being picked first. The message here mm. is more along the lines of even them. Yeah. Yeah. Even them. And look, look at what Jesus is doing. Look at the people he hangs around with. Look at the disciples. Look at the ones he socialises with. Look at the conversation with the Samaritan woman, the excluded the sinners. Yeah. Even them. Even them. God chooses even them. We are here to show the world not how high the bar is. We're here showing the world how low the bar is. Yeah. Yeah. Even them. Yeah. And it's not, it's, not an e it's not an end in itself. Uh, in John 15, uh, uh, verse 16, it says, I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. We're chosen for a purpose. Being chosen comes with responsibility. But chosen, chosen even them. The second thing it says here is a royal priesthood. Okay, well, if chosen isn't about being important, this one must be. Royal priesthood. That sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? <laughs> That's got to be about how important we are. <laughs> Priests get not only to dress up in funny clothes and wear peculiar hats, they get to tell other people what to do. Excellent. That will be us. And it's an easy trap. But what does royal priesthood actually mean? Well, the, the obvious way of looking at what royal priesthood actually means is looking at Jesus. Because... Um, he's a priest in the order of Melchizedek, which I'm sure Dave could explain at great length what the priest in the order of Melchizedek uh, it means. Um, uh, and he's also a king. So that's, seems to my view, a pretty comprehensive view of royal and priesthood. But the role of priests in the Old Testament isn't about telling people what to do. Uh, so when the Pharisees are kicking around, bossing people around, they're going way off piste. It's not about telling people what to do. The role of priests is to intercede for men. They're, they're these sort of interventionist people between men and God. And they're the ones who, who offer sacrifices. So priests are um, the intercessors, or the, they're, they're the intermediaries, and the, and the people who do the sacrifices. And so the priest's role isn't about status. It's about doing stuff. It's about helping make sure people get access to God. And likewise, if you look at how the Bible treats kings, 
Look at how Jesus treats being a king. Uh, so John 13, 3 to 5. Jesus knew the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Jesus knew his status. So, and I think that so in John 13, verse 4, is the most important so in the Bible. Um, Jesus knew all things had been put under his power, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. So Jesus tells us very, very clearly what royal means. Jesus takes that approach to royalty, the approach to status, and washes the disciples' feet. He takes on the most lowly job because he knows his status. And similarly, if you look at Jesus as a priest, so as a priest is one who offers sacrifice. Jesus does not offer a sacrifice that costs anyone else anything. He doesn't offer a sacrifice that costs anyone else anything. His sacrifice for his atonement was himself. Now, bear in mind, we are royal priesthood, so we are called to be priests. Paul, in Romans 12, talks about sacrifice too. And he says we should present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Mm -hmm. That's what sacrifice means as a priesthood now. So priesthood, royal priesthood, is not about status but of service. Interesting, actually, within this phrase royal priesthood, the, the royal there isn't about being a king priest. It's about being, that the, there's a status of royal, as in like royal seal or sort of a, a royal borough, that kind of, it's a descriptive term, uh, not a kind of, it's not, it's not a noun, if that makes sense. Um, so, it means, so royal here means kind of belonging to the king. And belonging to the king ties into the next bit. So the next bit there, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. So we've had chosen, we've had royal priesthood, holy nation, people belonging to God. Well, that's got to mean that we're better than everyone else. But holy doesn't mean better. The church isn't here as better. The people of God aren't here as better. It means separate. So what does holy look like? Well, there are lots of descriptions about holiness, lots of descriptions about chosen nation, lots of descriptions about holy nation, but and arguably the best is in Leviticus 20, 26, always lob in a Leviticus bit in any sermon, because um, uh, 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 you can normally work on the theory people haven't read Leviticus. Um, anyone who gets as far as Leviticus 20, jolly well played. Um, <laughs> Leviticus 20 says that being a holy nation isn't about what you've done. It's not about being better. Mm. Being a holy nation is, in Leviticus 26, God says to people, you are holy because I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. Yeah. Yeah. So it's holy nation and people belonging to God are kind of the same thing. Yeah. It's a holy nation. And set aside for him, that's the reason you can put them together. Now, belonging to God isn't slavery. This isn't like being a possession, although the language is, is quite possessive. It's a different sort of belonging. When we want to think about what does it mean to belong to God, yeah, yes, he's bought us. And the redemption, redemption is the language of, of purchase. But this isn't about being owned in an enslaved way. This is not about being owned in a way that's onerous. This is not about being owned in a way that's restrictive. The best description of ownership and what this means in Song of Songs. Uh, so Song of Songs is this beautiful love poem. Song of Songs, uh, chapter 6, verse 3, says, I am my beloved's, 
and he is mine. So same, it's language of ownership. I am my beloved's and he is mine. This is what it means to belong to God. It isn't that God's snaffled up like that. This is about being completed as a human being. This is about being what a real human being is in relationship. I am my beloved's and he is mine. A people belonging to God. I am my beloved's and he is mine. And it's in that that we are also a people. We are his beloveds. And we, he is ours. So when he's talking about in the past we're not a people and now we are a people, the reason we are a we is because we all belong to him. The, The reason we are a collective it's not because we're the same. It's not because we're you know, related to each other. It's that we, are, we have the same owner, the same father. The, the, the owner, I am my beloved, he is mine. So we are a we because we belong to him, not because we do it well. Which takes us into, finally, if it's... If it's not about us and how important we are, then what is it that makes it defines us? This passage is it is one of the most beautiful passages in the in, in the Bible because it takes us on a journey. It takes these descriptors and it makes things clearer and clearer as you go through it. It shines light. Um, the phrase here, it's even got in here, we are called out of darkness into his wonderful light. And this passage is one of those bits of wonderful light that helps us see and helps us understand the world and our place in it. And so he called us out. And it's the one who we belong to that adds meaning and adds definition and that brings us together. So as a people of God, we're defined as this. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The progression of this passage takes us there. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The thing that defines us the things that gives us status in the world, the thing that puts us as a church, what it means to be a church, what it means to be people of God, the things that give us a position in the universe, the thing that more than anything else says who we are is that we are receivers of mercy. That's what we are. That's the thing that equips us into the, go into the world. It's the thing that makes us holy, is that we are receivers of mercy. It defines us. We're not defined by the darkness that we came from. We're not defined by the things from which we needed mercy. We're defined by the light we have come to, and that we have received mercy. The gift that Jesus was talking about when he's describing the precious things of the kingdom of heaven, when he's talking about the lost pearl, the treasure hidden in the field, it's mercy that he's describing. Mercy freely given is the thing that sets us apart. It's the thing that makes us royal. It's the enabler of being priests. It's the sign of being chosen. It's the definition. And that's why, in the next part of the passage, it says we are to sing his praises. It's why we want to live good lives, inspire others to want to glorify God. It's why we're called to show mercy to those around us. And it's why we can call ourselves children of God so that we can be set apart to be with him forever. Amen. Shall we pray together? Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you that 
we can know what it means to be us. And what it means to be us is how we relate to you. And we relate to you through your glorious mercy. And Father, as we go out this week, pray that we can share that to those around us. Amen.